hand. All right. Um, so I'll just check that it's moving. All right. So what is intelligence? Okay. So I want you to get some warmed up, uh, neurologically speaking. Okay. So I'd like you to have a think just for a, a few seconds about the most intelligent person you know. So give yourself a few seconds. Who's the most intelligent person you know? It can be yourself if you wish. That's totally fine. Uh, but just have a think for yourself. Who's the most intelligent person that you know? Off you go. Okay. Now, the reason I'm asking you this is because it's a really difficult question, right? How do you know that someone else is more intelligent than you? How can you gauge that? What sort of metrics are you using, either consciously or unconsciously? Maybe it's someone that you know from school who has performed marginally better than you have in some standardized test. Maybe it's someone who's achieved some recognition that you think is particularly evocative of intelligence. You know, maybe it's someone very famous who's obtained maybe a Nobel Prize, or maybe it's someone who has been accepted into a very prestigious organization. The issue is that to, to really know someone's more intelligent than you are, you must have some sense of what intelligence is. So you must have some sort of conceptual framework, which is telling you this is what it means to be intelligent. But as we'll discuss in this lecture, and as you all very ably discussed in the essays you submitted to us, actually pinning down what it means to be intelligent is really, really tough. Okay. And what I suspect that a lot of you, as I do, when I try and work out, well, who's the most intelligent person I know, is that it's a big old fat mix of biography and autobiography. In other words, we try and sort of biographically identify a person that we think is super intelligent. But in doing so, we're probably highlighting features of intellect that we wish we had more of. So my mind instantly goes to colleagues at the University of Oxford, who I sit next to at lunch, who are, you know, fellows of the Royal Society, or who have, you know, um, statutory professorship chairs, or who are, you know, uh, chief executives at CERN, and you just think, oh my God, these people are, you know, mega brained intellectuals. I couldn't possibly deign to sit amongst them, right? But I suspect what I'm really doing there is not, re not accurately gauging their intelligence. I'm just kind of jealous. It's a sort of a case of, um, you know, the green eyed monster. So how much am I accurately gauging their intellect? And how much am I just sort of, it's a bit of a sort of wish fulfillment. I wish I was a bit more like them. And that's part of the issue of objectively gauging intelligence. I think it's actually really hard. And that's going to be the primary theme of this lecture, which is that intelligence is a mixture of some objective criteria, some stuff we can measure, but a huge lot of stuff which is subjective, which is down to perception, down to how we think we want things to be rather than how they actually are. And intelligence, therefore, is fundamentally difficult to measure in any meaningful sense. Anyway, not that that would ever let us uh, try. Stop and try. So um, let's start with some definitions. Now, this was the essay question you all had. I asked you to try and define intelligence. And you you did yourselves absolutely proud by demonstrating just how complicated it really is to define intelligence. Now, I'm going to start the first poll. So I'd love you to get involved. Um, so here we go. Uh, so can you give us some synonyms for intelligence? So if you go into Slido, they've got a word cloud poll. And if you can give us some words that mean intelligence, but as, as a different word. So there we go. We've got smart straight away. Oh, here we go. Very quick. All right. Good. Keep going. All right. I'll give you a few seconds. Oh, wow. Goodness. Okay. <laughs> All right. We've got 33 answers. All right. Keep them coming. Adaptiveness. I like that. Intellect, knowledgeable, clever. Lots of clevers. That's good. Okay, not sure how it's best to present this. Okay, you're doing really well. All right, let's try and uh, share the results. Okay, so hopefully now you can see the results. So clever has come out as a dominant uh, synonym, which makes a lot of sense. We've also got smart, we've got knowledge, we've got resourceful intellect are, are coming out quite highly. Um, there's a few sort of lesser used ones, brain power, awareness, cognitive thinking, sharp is an interesting one. Um, the reason that I wanted to start with this is because, you know, we should begin with 
etymology if you're trying to unravel a complicated idea like intelligence start at the beginning start with the word intelligence because it's the word that helps us structure our reality to a certain extent so we've got this language that we talk about well, where did that language come from what does that mean some of you in your essays pointed out that the word intelligence derives from latin and it means broadly speaking to understand so it's that's its sort of origin and various of these synonyms that you've come up with would similarly have that uh, interpretation as well okay but the language i think is really interesting and needs some careful close textured analysis because actually defining almost anything is quite a dangerous game because you're trying to put something into a box by using a particular word you're slapping a label on it as if it's you know a spice that's going to go on your spice rack and you're saying this is intelligence Boom. and it can be contained in this little sort of box and i will put all of the things that i think are connected with intelligence into said box and that can mean you're doing quite a lot of violence to the complexity of the concept language is a pretty violent mechanism because although we try and structure our reality using language it's not necessarily the case that reality structures our language our language structures reality so when we start putting things in boxes that changes the way we see the universe and the world i mean give me let me give you an example we use say the labels male and female to describe different genders but recent uh changes in attitudes have suggested that that sort of binary distinction in genders is not terribly accurate to the reality but it's structuring the way we think about that reality and that's a similar potential hazard with a word like intelligence so we need to be pretty careful okay there's also power and peril of the word is now this is going to sound slightly bonkers so i need to explain what i'm talking about here is oh, i've got a little noise outside sorry about that uh, is is a copular verb so x is y you're basically saying that i don't know if if you say so and so is intelligent then you're kind of saying that this person has an intelligent state of being permanently it's a permanent sort of facet of their personality and yet as we're all probably aware you're not likely to find someone who is always intelligent who's always doing the smartest thing so the word is kind of ignores the fact that there's a lot of context going on okay so that's one of the complications to bear in mind uh sorry just a second uh it's going to be your there we go okay so the language that we use is quite dangerous and even something as seemingly minor as the verb is can be powerful and this therefore gets us into the realm of what's called logomachy which is a fight over words so the way we understand intelligence is structured by the words we use for it we've got this word intelligence and so we're constantly trying to fit reality to to the word not trying to go the other way around and try and work out what reality is saying to us we're using the words we say to structure our reality ah and so we constantly try and work out well, does this person understand this situation and therefore are they intelligent because that's what the word intelligent means but that's where the danger could lie so be very aware that sometimes the way we understand the universe is through the prism of language it's basically unavoidable we just need to be very careful and i've got a slightly sort of annoying uh, observation which is that the word intelligence is heterological now heterological means that the word cannot describe itself so a very famous example of heterology would be monosyllabic the word monosyllabic is not monosyllabic right so it's a heterology and intelligence means to understand and yet we conspicuously don't understand intelligence so i would argue it is also a heterology and we might be better off with an autology which is a word that does describe itself like indescribable the word indescribable is indescribable just like the word pentasyllabic has five syllables in it so that is an autology and i would suggest that intelligence is at best indescribable okay now this may feel like sort of fairly trite and annoying wordplay but i think we need to be very careful with the language we use when we say so and so is intelligent we're losing a lot of the contextual detail which can help us understand what understanding even means okay let me give you an example blue the color blue we can objectively identify the electromagnetic radiation that we describe as blue 
we can, for example, uh, measure something that radiates at between 380 and 500 nanometers, and that is blue. But what you feel when you see a beautiful blue sky or when you see your friend wearing a crushed blue velvet dinner jacket uh, to the sixth form ball or when you see someone who's in a blue mood, that is entirely unique to you. Your perception of blue is unknowable to everyone else but you. And that's what, I, what intelligence is to me. It's something that we can have glimpses at in an objective sense. We can occasionally take some measures of, but actually the full range of what it means to understand is shot through with subjectivity, with perception, with self-perception, what we want, what we believe, what we hope for, not what is there. Okay. So you need to be very careful between reality and our perception of reality. We can understand certain facets of the physics of blue, but what someone perceives as blue is known only to that person. Okay. Now that's perhaps getting a little bit philosophical for a Monday morning, but never mind. Let's carry on. Um, humanism, right? Let's talk about human beings. Now there are various ways that people have tried to carve up intelligence to try and sort of do some analysis of its different factors. And a common place to start comes from a person called Howard Gardner, who's a Harvard professor of education. Uh, and he and others have spoken about metacognitive and existential intelligences. These are sort of, if you like, baseline human forms of intelligence. What they mean are metacognitive means that you can think about thinking. So it's thinking of thinking, which we assume is uniquely human. We're not aware of any other animal that's capable of reflecting on how their brain works. And existential intelligence is this notion that we are aware of our own mortality. We are aware of our existence and that that existence will one day come to an end. And again, we think that we're the only human beings that have that degree of, sorry, the only beings with that degree of consciousness. So we think of them as uniquely human. Obviously, we don't know for sure. And of course, these types of thinking skill vary even amongst human beings. But here are some few sort of fundamental questions about our species. Why are humans so intelligent relative to other species of animal? How is it that we've dominated the globe? I mean, maybe we, again, think we have, but fleas are, are actually ultimately in charge. They're far brainier than we are, and they're just biding their time whilst we sort of destroy our environment, and then they'll take over in some sort of grand coup later uh, in a few centuries' time. Obviously, that seems far-fetched, but, you know, <laughs> we just simply don't know. Um, and, you know, perhaps a more fine-grained uh, version of the question might be, why are we conscious of our own mortality? Where does consciousness come from? Why? Are we conscious of this? Why is it in any way useful? If we think according to sort of Darwinian evolutionary biology, why might a human species have developed that sense of itself? What's the benefit? Well, there's all sorts of fantastically interesting theories about this, about how Homo sapiens developed into this thing that we are now, um, that, you know, likes dancing and goes to Aldi and uh, watches Strictly Come Dancing and all the rest of it. You know, how did we get to this particular phase of our uh, neural development? Well, a lot of the theories come down to things like the fact that we stand on two legs. Now, this might seem a fairly unimportant detail of human beings, but we're the only primate that w walks permanently on two legs. There are various primates that can walk on two legs, like lemurs, you may have seen sort of running from tree to tree but standing permanently is as far as primates go a uniquely human feature now the reason that matters is that it's energy saving it's a little bit more efficient to walk on two legs than to knuckle walk as say chimpanzees do on four limbs and it means that that human beings could have a wider range within which they could hunt so early homo sapiens could range further than other primates now, why would that affect your brain? Well, if you are going to have a very large environment that you need to potentially take control of, then you need a brain that's flexible enough and adaptable to different scenarios, different environments. Many animals live in fairly sort of, sim uh, f fairly sort of singular environments. They're not that changing and therefore they don't need lots and lots of different processing functions in their brains in order to adapt to their environment because there's only really one type of environment they're adapting to. Whereas human beings can adapt to tundra, desert, forest, 
beach, ocean, side, you name it, right? So humans are significantly more adaptable. Now, of course, you could rightly point out that other animals have even bigger ranges, like say an albatross, but you know, that those animals will still be interacting with their environment in relatively singular ways. So it will tend to be on beaches and next to oceans rather than a range of different environments. Another feature of uh, human intellect which anthropologists suggest helped us develop this amazing neural capacity is cooking. Uh, and again, this is something that we may take epically for granted, but if you cook, then you can adapt to new environments much more easily because all of a sudden foodstuffs that were inedible, maybe even toxic, can be processed and used. And indeed, they can be stored for much longer if they can be cooked. So that means that human beings can range even further than they were able to originally. So cooking, and taking advantage of fire is one of the other components that's helped us develop our brains. It also means that we can unlock the energy potential of more foods to a far more efficient extent than other animals can. And then ultimately, the sort of infrastructure that we see around us now, many argue, is derivative of fighting. When populations became more dense, they started to fight with other population centers over resources. And that led to the development of bureaucracies and ultimately armies and languages and histories and culture. And so a lot of this comes down to our sort of slightly violent tendencies. Um, now, this is, of course, you know, quite a simplified uh, narrative, but you know, there's a lot to it. Uh, another really fascinating uh, argument made by the MIT professor Rebecca Kleinberger is to do with the descent of the larynx. So in human beings, the larynx is relatively low in, the, uh, in, in our necks. And that means that we have a far greater range of sounds that we can make. And without this, we wouldn't have been able to form such complex languages. We can form all sorts of different sounds that other animals simply don't have the facility to do to the same extent. And this descent of the larynx is therefore in her mind associated with the ascent of humanity. Okay. Now we can do some, some comparisons to try and work this out because uh, here we've got side by side a human skull and a Neanderthal skull. Now Neanderthals are often sort of used as a byword for stupidity for these creatures that were completely intellectually incapable. Now that is desperately unfair. Uh, Neanderthals buried their dead um, with jewelry that they had manufactured. Um, so they had culture, they had language, they didn't have quite such a far descended larynx as human beings had, but you know, they still had a language as far as uh, as we can glean. So why is it that human beings not only survived but have dominated and Neanderthals have now all died out? Well, there's various theories to this. One of which is that uh, Neanderthals are not quite as curious as human beings. They are, um, they ra ranged quite far, but they didn't go that far outside of Western Europe. So their remains have predominantly been found in Western Europe. Whereas human beings, of course, dominated the entire globe. Now, the implication of that is that human beings had to walk in order to say colonize Australia or to colonize North America. Now those walks are no small fry, right? Can you imagine walking to America from Asia? That would mean during an ice age that people walked across what was then a frozen Bering Strait between modern day Russia and modern day Alaska. And they had to physically walk there not knowing what was on the other side of the horizon. They didn't know they were walking to America, did they? They were just pushing on because presumably the environment behind them was not sustainable. They, they had some sort of impetus to get them out of there. The uh, Neanderthals didn't seemingly feel the same impetus. It's also suggested that they were killed off by humans. So again, our violent tendencies is, is connected to our intellectual power, I'm afraid to say. Um, so something to do with our curiosity is an important part of our humanism as well. And so this raises a couple of awkward questions. So first of all, and I've got a poll for this. So uh, let's, uh, let's hit the poll, hang on. So let's stop that poll and let's start this one. So the Apollo program cost upwards of $150 billion in uh, modern money. Was it worth it? Yes or no? Right, off you go, vote. I'll explain why, why I'm asking you this in a second. Oh, no, it's creeping up. Okay. We've got 82% say yes. 23%. Oh, no, no, it's, no, it's stealing a mark. All right. No, no, <laughs> no, he's going back. All right. Okay. Interesting. How many responses? Oh, we've nearly got everyone responding. Okay, this is good. 
Okay, cool. I think we'll hold it there. So 72% of you think it was worth the money, extraordinary amount of money to put uh, men on the moon. And 28%, nearly a third of you thought, no, no not worth it. Okay, so that's, that's really interesting. Um, now, why am I asking you this? Well, I'm trying to sort of get to the grips with why we even did that. Why was it considered that the moon was something that ought to be uh, accessed by human beings? And I think this is, again, part of our curiosity for what's on the other side of the figurative horizon. What is over there? What is North America? If Homo sapiens had that degree of curiosity, it's part of what helped us forge new uh, directions and, and dominate new environments. And it might be part of the story of us. Therefore, it's almost irrelevant to ask why we put men on the moon. We put men on the moon because that's what human beings do. They, they hunt, they search, they explore. That's part of our sort of intellectual journey. Um, anyway, this is a slightly sort of provocative question, and I'm asking it out of a, out of a personal sense, and I, there's no poll for this, but is, is it stupid somehow to be anxious? Now, the reason I'm asking this is because, again, the way our brains are structured is that we sometimes... Um, in fairly pop psychology terms, talk about a lizard brain and a human brain, that because we are the product of eons of evolution, we have different parts of our brains that perform very different functions, some of which are pre-human in their origins. And that's why we call them the lizard brain, because we have many of those neural functions in common with other animals. And then the human brain, which is the bit that you can broadly see on the outside, that's the new part in evolutionary terms that's the human part now i am a, a lifetime sufferer of anxiety to the to the extent that i have to take medication to deal with it i'm constantly making calculations about risk which my human brain knows are outlandish so you know if i walk out of the door with my two young children there's going to be some sort of cataclysmic catastrophic result of this that's how my lizard brain speaks to my human brain my human brain says that the odds of that are tiny so let's just go and get on with it. But nonetheless, there's still this part of me that sort of nags away and says, oh, but it might happen. And I get these what are called intrusive thoughts where that lizard brain constantly says, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if the other happens? Now, is this evidence of some sort of stupidity? Now, I would argue, probably <laughs> predictably enough, no. Uh, I think this, again, is a problem with the use of the word is, that saying is anxiety stupid is just sort of implied that it is always unintelligent to be anxious. Whereas, of course, we wouldn't have survived as a species if we were never anxious, because then we would have been far too laissez-faire and just trotted off towards a volcano or into the mouth of a saber-toothed tiger or something. But there's this sort of really fascinating tension between our, if you like, pre-human brains and our human brains. And sometimes that tension is really empowering and important. You know, some of the emotions we feel are some of the most important things that we seek out in life. And that comes from our quote unquote lizard brains. But I think it's worth thinking about the complexity of the brain and how our thoughts are formed because it's really not as straightforward as, as we might hope it to be. Here's another sort of quite provocative question. Is it stupid to be selfless? Now, this is another thing that uh, evolutionary biologists and anthropologists have tried to work out, um, which is that human beings um, are appear to show acts of altruism. And they've tried to work that out. Why would we do that? And we're not unique as a species in showing altruism to other, to other animals. But it does seem to be particularly advanced in human beings. And so the suggestion is that that's somehow self-defeating. If you think in a sort of Darwinian sense, if you are supporting a, a rival group uh, with different genetics to you, then you're basically diminishing the chance of your own genes propagating and you're doing yourself harm. There was a man called George R. Price, who was a very important evolutionary biologist. He inspired various people, including Richard Dawkins, who famously wrote The Selfish Gene. And in The Selfish Gene, Dawkins argued that altruism is basically self-defeating. There's no rationale for doing it. And Price agreed. But the interesting and very tragic story of Price is that after he'd written this, this sort of powerful uh, work in evolutionary biology saying that whenever you see altruism, it's only within genetic groups. He then spent the rest of his life trying to prove himself wrong. He started divesting himself of all of his worldly goods. He gave away, to the extent of giving away his clothes, he befriended the homeless people in London where he was then living to try and prove that his theory that you're only altruistic to your genetic in-group was incorrect. 
And ultimately, uh, he committed suicide by severing his carotid artery. And that was the sort of ultimate action of someone who was selfless. To, I mean, it's, it's a really tragic story, but this is a person who created this theory that it is against our genetics to be altruistic and then spent the rest of his life in a self-effacing mode of behavior. And it just is so interesting to work out why we would ever be altruistic, why we would ever be selfless. Now, my theory to this is that human beings are social animals and that you know babies are completely uh, defenseless and they rely on the altruism of those around them. Now, of course, those around them will typically be those that are genetically very similar or the same as them. But actually, the complexity of our environment means that we interact with people with different genetics all the time. And that would be true of primates. They're not always going to be genetic monocultures. And so we need to collaborate and be cooperative with each other. And that's therefore very far from stupid to be selfless. It's absolutely ingrained in our survival impetus. Anyway, um, just uh, FYI, those of you who are waiting for the nine o'clock um, sessions, they're going to be pushed back a little bit. So we'll probably start at about 9.15. So just, uh, just so you're aware. Okay. Um, so there are various other types of intelligence. Um, so what about crystallized intelligence, which is to do with memory? So this is another factor. So is it very smart? If someone who knows a lot of stuff, is that person necessarily smarter? So I don't have a poll for this, but just out of interest, you can think to yourself, who is the more intelligent of these two? Right, this is on the left, David Thomas. And on the right, you probably recognize David Tennant. Now, David Thomas is the British champion of reciting pi. He can recite pi to 22,500 digits, which is very impressive. It's not world beatingly impressive, but it's very impressive. And on the right, we've got David Tennant. Now, why would I choose David Tennant? Well, he is one of many actors who has played Hamlet. Now, Hamlet, as a role, has 60,000 letters in it. Now, Tennant, therefore, was able to memorize 60,000 alphabetic digits, if you like. Um, so does that mean that he's almost three times better at crystallized intelligence than David Thomas, who memorized Pi? I, I leave it as an open question, but I think it's worth noting that the way people memorize Pi is they do basically tell themselves stories. They form groups of numbers. And then with those numbers, they make them into characters or objects. And those characters and objects play out a drama so that they can remember pi up to huge numbers of digits. And so David Tennant memorizing the alphabetic digits in a sort of similar way, you could argue is basically the same feat. Um, we tend to sort of lionize people who have extraordinary memories, including memories for things that might be frankly useless, such as pi to 22,500 digits. But there's lots of people that can do similar feats if they're motivated to do it, if they want to play Hamlet, for example. So all I'm suggesting is that you think a bit more about that. OK, right, here's time for another poll. So intelligent pets. Uh, what are the most intelligent pets? Right, have at it. What do you think? This is probably going to come down to a dogs versus cats battle, but feel free to put in any other pets that you, uh, you may wish to. Oh, parrots. Parrots come out early. Crows. Interesting choice. OK, like that. Ravens, dolphins. You got a pet dolphin, have you? <laughs> that's, that's fine. OK, that's very good. Very good. Oh, Florence says, David Tennant also think that the ability to act is one of the most complex activities. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. Oh, we've got Hedy Lamar stated, right? You're going to have to hold on to that thought because she's coming up. OK. Keep going, keep going. All right. Let's have a look at the results. <laughs> OK, so if I show you my screen. All right, so you should be able to see that dogs coming out a strong favorite for the most intelligent pets. Cats, not as many votes as I thought they might get. Par parrots are doing better than cats, apparently, um, which is fine. You know, parrots have a strong vocabulary. I can understand your thought process there. Um, octopus is up there. Octopus have multiple brains and multiple hearts, so I think I can understand that. 
pet chimpanzee. <laughs> okay, nice. All right. Now, um, the reason I'm asking you this is because I want to talk about another form of intelligence, which is visual and auditory perception. Now, again, when we tr when we try and sort of break down intelligence into its multiple factors, uh, we tend to ooh, do so in a way that favors human beings, that favors us. That's quite sort of self-congratulatory. And we sort of say, oh, well, to be intelligent means you have to have good language skills, means that you have to have logic. But actually, if we if by intelligence we literally go back to the original word, it means to understand or something about your environment, you could argue that animals are way ahead of us because they can perceive so much more detail than we can. Now, my vote would go to dogs, but that's because I'm a dog person. Here is an English Springer Spaniel, and he is a bomb sniffer dog. Now, his sense of smell is roughly a thousand times better than mine. Um, to the extent that dogs can be trained not only to sniff explosives, but they can also smell early stage cancer uh, because of some of the chemicals that are put off by absolutely astonishing level of perception. Okay, so the, in terms of their capacity to perceive the world, and this is neither visual nor auditory perception, but olfactory perception is almost unmatched. I say almost unmatched because actually MIT have shown that you can train bees to do the same things and it only takes three hours to do so. Now bees could be another good shout for a very intelligent uh, animal, indeed a pet because many people keep bees, um, because not only can you train them very quickly to perform the same functions as a sniffer jog, um, but they have a hive mind, literally they operate as a hive and so they agglomerate their shared intellect. Now, it's quite common for us to sort of dismiss insects as just, you know, something that's worthy of being squashed. But another thing to bear in mind is that bees are the only species of animal, apart from humans, as far as we know, that can communicate about something they're not perceiving. Now, let me sort of walk you through that. There are lots of animals that can communicate with each other and with other species. But when they do so, they are communicating about something that they are perceiving. They're seeing, they're hearing, they're smelling, they're tasting, and so forth. What no species can do, apart from humans and bees, is communicate about something that they're not perceiving. So we can talk about, you know, uh, I don't know, I could talk about Boris Johnson. I can't see, hear, smell, <laughs> taste Boris Johnson, but I can talk about him, right? So that we can talk about something abstractly. And bees can do the same. Bees do a little dance called a waggle dance. And what they'll do is that once they've detected some nice pollen rich flowers, they'll come back to the hive and then they'll waggle their rear quarters. It kind of looks a bit like twerking in the direction of those beautiful flowers. And the number of waggles will, will uh, denote the distance towards those flowers. So the bee is communicating to other bees, oh, the great flowers are over in that direction and they are this many waggles. And they can't see those flowers because they're too far away. They can't smell them. They can't hear them, blah, blah, blah. Um, so bees, I think, ought to you know, have a shout for being one of the most intelligent pets because of their degree of perception and their language skills. OK, um, footballers' brains. Now, what else uh, would we consider as forms of intelligence? Well, we need to talk about retrieval and cognitive speediness. This is another thing that uh, uh, various neuroscientists um, have pointed out as important to intelligence. And few people can match footballers, right? This man, this man, David Beckham, is often maligned as a bit dim. And that's because we tend to lionize linguistic and logical abilities above everything else when we talk about intelligence. So he was mocked mercilessly by pundits back in the 90s and the early noughties when he was uh, prominent in uh, English football. But this guy can score a corner, uh, score a goal from a corner, right? That's insane. Can you imagine how much processing power that must take and how much practice it must have taken? He is having to calculate all sorts of variables within tiny fractions of a second to, to achieve something like that. He's thinking about the forces on the ball. He's thinking about the wind. He's thinking about the position of other players. He's thinking about everything. OK, that is insane cognitive ability. Right. That really ought to be stressed how impressive that is. OK, so just because he's maybe not the most eloquent person, he doesn't have a vocabulary like Stephen Fry. Frankly, he's made a lot more money than many of these sneering uh, chatterati who tend to look down their noses at footballers. So he's obviously no fool, is he? He's got 
the skills to back it up. And he also raises another crucial point about cognitive abilities, which is that if you train hard enough, you can develop them. The thing with David Beckham is that, yeah, he had some natural gifts, if you like, that helped him be a good footballer. But my goodness, did he train and train and train. There's some footage of him when he was a six-year-old and he was on a television program and he was doing keepy uppies just all the time because he trained that hard to make sure that his brain was ready to perform those tasks almost automatically. And you can do the same. If there's a particular skill you want, you just need to devote your time and energy to doing it. And we'll discuss this, that a little bit more later. But um, we're still going through the various sort of types of intelligence that, that might exist. So another one is called fluid intelligence. So we spoke about crystallized intelligence, which is knowing stuff, memory, knowledge. Fluid intelligence is creating stuff, using things that you know in order to create something new. Maybe a particularly prominent example of this is this guy, uh, Johannes Mozart. Uh, no, Wolfgang um, Amadeus Mozart. My goodness, getting his name wrong. There you go. Shows my poor crystallized intelligence. Anyway, famous old joke, but by the time this guy was my age, he'd already been dead for two years. He was writing um, operas when he was four, three or four years old. I mean, it's just incredible. The degree of fluidity in his intelligence, his creative capacity was unmatched at the time. Um, other sort of polymaths and highly creative individuals you might want to talk about could include, say, Leonardo da Vinci, people who were able to put their hand to almost anything and create something new. They weren't just using existing knowledge, they were developing new knowledge and developing new ideas, and hence the fluidity, the 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 uh, malleability of their intelligence. Okay, now that brings us to the end of the classic form of intelligence being broken down. So that's what the way scientists try to measure intelligence. But as I started with, I said that yes, there are bits of intelligence we can measure, but there are lots of stuff. There's lots of stuff to do with intelligence that is more a matter of perception. And I think the two ought to go together. So there's the objective reality of stuff that we could measure. You know, I could measure how much of pi you can recall. Um, but there's a lot that's more subjective. And I think a good place to start with is with emotional intelligence. How well does someone empathize with you? How compassionate are they? This may sound like sort of soft, namby-pamby, liberal drivel that I'm talking about emotional intelligence, but this brings people extraordinary power, right? Think about someone like Barack Obama. He has emotional intelligence in spades. And that combined with supreme intellectual and linguistic intelligence has made him an extremely powerful man. Emotional intelligence is not to be sneered at. Someone who is able to connect with other human beings to try and empathize with them, to think what they might want out of a situation can make themselves very, very influential. Emotional intelligence is very difficult to measure. And there are a few reliable objective metrics of it. And this is therefore why I'm introducing it here, because I think this is part of the perceptive side of intelligence. People that can help other people get along with them do have a form of intelligence because they're able to think the way the other person might think. Classic example is the so-called bedside manner uh, with doctors. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that doctors that have a good bedside manner get better outcomes for their patients. That, that emotional intelligence is far from unimportant. It actually can create differential medical outcomes to an extraordinary degree. So we need to perhaps think very carefully about the, the power of emotional intelligence. Okay. Um, and it links to cultural influences. So I said, well, this is not me being an ambi pamby liberal, um, because culture says a lot about what we perceive to be intelligent, what we're allowed to focus on. In Britain, we tend to lionize linguistic forms of intelligence, logic, and fluid intelligence. If you come to a university like Oxford, we'll constantly be trying to make you create new ideas because we're almost obsessed with the liberal model of education, which says that you are the fountain of all knowledge. So you have to come up with ideas yourself. If you go to university in other countries, like in America, they will be more interested in how you can consolidate your crystallized intelligence, how you can develop your good recall of existing knowledge. Rather than just constantly contributing new ideas, they want to see that you can talk the talk of existing ideas. They also try and encourage people to be stronger leaders. We're not particularly interested in that uh, at universities like Oxford, which is why we don't tend to look at 
uh, people's extracurricular activities as a relevant guide to whether or not we should admit someone. In America, they absolutely do. If you don't have a strong roster of extracurriculars, then you're very unlikely to get into the top universities in America. In Britain, we don't consider that important. So that shows that the mindset differs from context to context. Different countries value different forms of intelligence. And that value is itself interesting. Where does that come from? Is it valuable or considered valuable because it's better geared towards the labor market in that country? Probably. So Britain is a service industry. Uh, we dominate in certain sectors where creative, creativity is highly valued. And therefore we train people to become very creative. In America, there is also that, but there's, there's lots of other people that are uh, contributing to processes and systems. And therefore having lots of creative individuals might break those systems. So there's a real mixture of cultural influences. Now, a very common and powerful and maybe even sort of insidious cultural influences towards uh, what's called ideological uh, and operation versus operational intelligence. Now, ideological is the idea that you're told you ought to think like this. And the operational is how you actually think. So, for example, as a man, I'm told, well, ha was told, at least doesn't happen anymore. But when I was growing up, and this wasn't by my parents, by the way, but it's, you know, by sort of broad social cultural forces, it was said that, you know, men don't cry, you have a stiff upper lip, you think logically and you solve your problems through sort of clear, incisive uh, interrogation of the problem. Blah, blah, blah. The problem is that that was the ideological intelligence, but the operational intelligence of me was of enormous sensitivity, right? So I would easily break down into tears at the end of a Disney film because... I just couldn't deal with the sort of the emotional turmoil of it all, right? <laughs> so my ideological intelligence was, oh, boys don't cry. My operational intelligence was, no, I'm totally going to cry. <laughs> so there's a sort of dreadful cognitive dissonance. And this is a common cause of depression and anxiety in people, especially um, uh, men. Men are more likely to suffer from uh, uh, suicidal thoughts. And suicide is the greatest killer of young men in this country still. Um, because there's this sense of what a man is supposed to be and what a man is that is sort of differentiated. And therefore, there's this sort of idea of what intelligent men look like versus what intelligent men may be like. And that is an important thing to consider when it comes to cultural influences in how we understand intelligence. And, and so linking to that gendered idea, of course, also has deleterious effects on women. So don't get me wrong, although there are difficulties for men, there are, of course, many difficulties for women. Perhaps a, a clear example of this is this notion that women are not as good at maths as men. Now, this is really fascinating because uh, there is no evidence for this whatsoever in young children. So when girls and boys both take maths tests, they both perform just as well. There's absolutely no differentiation whatsoever. And then a gap starts to emerge as you go through secondary school with boys doing a little bit better than girls. But it's not statistically significant. It's a tiny margin. And then the gap grows enormously when it comes to university level and the, the level of postgraduate degrees. So the argument which seems most persuasive to me is that there is no biological differentiation of any significance. It's a social differentiation. In other words, there's this narrative that little boys are told you're likely to be better at math and little girls are told math isn't really a girl's subject. And so girls have their confidence sapped. They're told you're not going to be that good at math, so don't bother trying. And so as they get older, they internalize that narrative and they say, right, I'm not going to try maths because it's not, it's not for girls. It's a boys subject. Now, if you do a bit of an international comparison, parts of the former Soviet Union had no such ideological framework. And so in those countries, degrees in maths and computer science are 50-50 split male-female. There's no gender imbalance whatsoever. In the UK, there's this huge gender imbalance because we've got this perpetual narrative that women can't do maths, even though there's no biological evidence for that whatsoever. It's cultural. It's just a story that people are telling each other. And hence why I think when we talk about intelligence, a huge dollop of it is perception, not just reality. And we need to be very careful to break down that perception to challenge it. OK, and this is a, a lady that someone's already mentioned on the chat. Uh, she's called Hedy Lamar, and she's a great example of this. She was a Hollywood actress here uh, playing uh, suitably enough in Samson and Delilah. And uh, she came up with uh, stream swapping radio waves, uh, which were 
which she developed during the Second World War to help hide torpedoes. So torpedoes were targeted using radio waves, and those radio waves could be jammed if they were going along a single frequency. But if you could swap the frequency around, then you could hide the torpedo effectively. Now, that not only became a useful military technology, uh, but it was also the forerunner of Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. So the very fact that we're talking right now is thanks to her mathematical abilities. So this, this sort of perpetual insidious narrative that men do certain things and women do certain other things doesn't bear up with reality. It's a, it's a part of our understanding of intelligence, which is constructed by society and culture, not by biology and reality. Okay. Now, what about post-intelligence? Well, what sort of world are we living in now? Right, time for another quiz, because I think you could do with a refresher. I've got three Trump tweets, and your, your um, task, should you choose to accept it, is to identify the tweet that is fake. Okay, so I'll go through them all, and you can uh, have a look. So just give me a second. Where's it gone? Okay, so which of these three tweets is the fake one? So is it this one? China respects my very, very large brain. I'm not going to try the voice. Um, sorry, losers and haters, but my IQ is one of the highest, and you all know it. Please don't feel so stupid or insecure. It's not your fault. Or thirdly, uh, amazing how the haters and losers keep tweeting the name F face von Clownstick like they're so original and like no one else is doing it. So your three choices are China respects my very, very large brain. Sorry, losers and haters, but my IQ is one of the highest and you will know it. Please don't feel so stupid or insecure. It's not your fault. Or amazing how the haters and losers keep tweeting the name F face von Clownstick like they are so original and like no one else is doing it. Right. So which one is uh, the fake tweet? OK, some votes coming in. All right. Oh, oh, it's split pretty evenly. This is interesting. OK. All right. So let me just share share my screen. All right. So you can see that uh, tweet number two has come out as the winner. All right. So let me go through them. In fact, the answer is tweet number one. Now, this is a true quote but it wasn't a tweet. <laughs> so he did say this, but he didn't tweet it. Uh, the other two are true tweets. Um, and you can look them up if you like, including this one, which is my favorite. Now, <laughs> we've maybe heard it, you maybe have heard of post-truth, this idea that we're in a world where what is real and not real doesn't really matter. What matters is what you can convince someone of. And so that's why I want to talk about post-intelligence, that people with a great de deal of confidence can convince others that they are highly intelligent, even if they maybe aren't. Now, I'm not trying to make a political point here. I'm not trying to say whether or not you should or should not like Donald Trump. I don't think that would be inappropriate right now. But the point is that regardless of what you think about him, he has been able to convince lots of people through just sheer bravado, through sheer force of personality that he is capable. Now, he could be an example, if not the exemplar of what's known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. Now, the Dunning-Kruger effect is a psychological phenomenon which describes that people with very low skills often have very high confidence in their abilities. And conversely, people with very high skills have very low confidence in their abilities. The explanation is that if you're highly, highly skilled, let's say you're a professor of medicine, you know how much you don't know. You are aware of the limitations of your skill set and your knowledge because you can identify it better because you have the skills to even identify the blind spots in what you are able to do. Whereas people with very low skills don't actually even have the sensitivity to be aware of what they don't know. And so they tend to be wildly confident, right? You see this quite a lot in politics and say economics, the people that don't know a lot about those subjects tend to be highly confident in what they think. And that's, some would argue, is misplaced confidence. And Donald Trump could be an exemplary uh, uh, case of this, that he, he doesn't know a great deal but he's magnificently confident and therefore convinces lots of people that they should follow and believe him. Um, another possibility, and this was raised by his uh, niece in a recent book, Mary Trump, is that he, has, he is a sociopath and therefore he doesn't much care what other people think. He will lie and he feels no, no compunction not to. So he's, he's just blasé about it and he doesn't have that sort of emotional case of empathy or or regret that many people would tend to have now i don't know i've never sat down with the man i've never met him i, do, I don't have the knowledge to pontificate i don't want to be 
ironically saying, I know everything about Trump when I don't. Um, but he's just an inst interesting case where sometimes how intelligent someone seems can be a matter of just smoke and mirrors. It can just be almost like a magic act. They can convince you they're intelligent, even if maybe they're not. So where does intelligence come from? Right. Well, nature plays a role. There are certain sort of genetic uh, dispositions. Now, perhaps in the most sort of extreme cases in particular, this can count. So you could talk about prodigies and savants, people that have extraordinary intellectual abilities like Mozart. Uh, there's also what are known as synesthetes. These are people that can see um, different um, connections between senses. So, for example, they might... Uh, see colors when they are thinking about various different things or they might smell something when they are trying to write some music some famous synesthetes include some of the most powerful and important musicians and artists in in history so people like vincent van gogh saw swirling colors around him as he was thinking about ideas and that informed his beautiful paintings uh, pharrell williams the musician is also a synesthete um, so there are certain things where just through biological accident, if you like, people have certain capabilities that others wouldn't have. It would be a bit like if you're born seven foot tall, you're going to have a natural advantage in playing basketball. Obviously, that's not sufficient to be a good basketball player, but it helps. And there's also autism spectrum disorder. People with, uh, with ASD can often have extremely good uh, memory retrieval, for example, crystallized intelligence, um, which is far beyond uh, what would be normal. Uh, whatever normal means. Uh, there's also claims of sort of left brain, right brain dominance. In other words, that some people are left brain dominant, meaning that they are more logical and mathematical, whereas others are more right brain dominant, meaning that they're more creative. I'm afraid this is nonsense. There's, there's no supporting this whatsoever. And you can tell it's kind of nonsense because let's take something like the facility with mathematics. Maths is actually very creative. It tends to be that we talk about maths as highly logical and structured. But if you want to solve complex problems, then you need to be quite creative. So the idea that it's just the left brain doing all the work, I'm afraid, is just not true. And there's no evidence to back it up. OK, um, we can also see the influence of nature through trauma and disease. And there's a couple of interesting cases I want to talk to talk through. So the first is Phineas Gage. Now, he was working on the railways in, in America and he was working with iron rods, including the one that he's holding in his hands. Um, and they had to compact uh, gunpowder into a hole and then use the gunpowder and the rod to to secure the train tracks in place. A mistake happened on uh, on the work site and the iron rod did this. Uh, it went through his skull um, and it knocked out his left prefrontal cortex. And you can see here, you know, he's holding the rod and he's missing an eye uh, and it gave him a portion of a frontal lobotomy. Amazingly, he survived, but it completely transformed his personality. He went from being uh, a jovial, emotionally intelligent man to someone who had no impulse control, uh, who started fights regularly, who couldn't empathize. His case is so important because up to that stage, it was thought that the whole brain does all of the cognitive work and it all contributes to the same stuff. Whereas after his case, it was quite clear that different parts of the brain hold different functional importances. And if you slice one out, it'll change someone's personality. And he really reinforced how the brain is put together um, in, a, in a fascinating way. And similarly, and very tragically, is this, is this man, Charles Whitman. This is a slightly awkward case, but he committed mass murder uh, when he climbed a bell tower at the University of Austin and he shot people. He was a he, used a sniper rifle to just kill people uh, until he was killed himself. It was found uh, through an autopsy that he had a, a large brain tumor pressing against his amygdala. And the hypothesis was that this is what made him uh, go on this murderous rampage, that he had went from being a completely mild mannered, kind man to suddenly becoming a murderer and that it was to do with just neurophysiology. So we can see that how we have a better idea today than we did in the past about how the brain works and how the brain works at its best, but also how it can sometimes lead to disorders and problems. But there's also nurture. You can nurture your brain. And maybe one of the most famous examples is, is Albert Einstein's brain and the brains of London cabbies. Now, Einstein uh, died in the 50s and his brain was uh, taken out during autopsy. Now, his family had insisted that he be buried with 
his brain in it, and so his body was be would be buried in its entirety. But the pathologist at Princeton University, where the autopsy was uh, carried out, stole the brain. And in fact, this man desperately, unethically, traveled around the US with the brain in his boot uh, and showed it off at science fairs for the next couple of decades, which is not something <laughs> you would get past an ethics board these days. But the guy felt, the pathologist felt that the world needs to see Einstein's brain because it holds so many interesting secrets as to how someone can develop their intelligence. Now, it was quite clear that Einstein was born with certain features of his brain which helped him be a genius. But he also developed features in his brain that made him more skillful. So it was a mixture of nature and nurture. So like I say, if you're born seven foot tall, you might find it easier to play basketball, but you're still going to have to do an awful lot of practice to be one of the best. And Einstein is a great example of this. For example, uh, recent studies have shown that his brain had a higher concentration of, of what are known as glial cells than most other people have. And glial cells are are a type of cell in the brain that you can actually that can actually develop in response to stimulating circumstances and they can help with the nutrition of the neurons and uh, so through sort of Im immersing himself in highly stimulating environments the glial cells developed in his brain to an unusual degree also the corpus callosum the corpus callosum is a sort of fibrous tube which connects the two hemispheres of the brain had far more connections than other brains of a similar um, maturity to Einstein's. So he had greater connectivity between the left and right hemispheres than most human beings have. And that is a mixture of sort of nature and nurture through hard work. Perhaps the most obvious example of nurturing his own cognitive abilities is this, uh, the red, the darkened red uh, highlighted part of the brain here on the right um, hemisphere is called the omega fold or omega sign fold. Um, and that's associated with people that are exceptionally good at playing the violin. And what uh, happens is that when you play the violin and you hold the neck with your left hand, the, uh, the brain develops uh, in ways to make that almost automatic behavior. And extremely proficient musicians and, and violinists in particular often have this omega fold. And so this is just a, sh a straightforward example of how the architecture of his brain was molded through hard work and practice. And the, the upshot is that if you want to have some sort of amazing cognitive ability, you can have it, but you're going to have to work for it. All right. Another example is London cabbies. Now, London cabbies have to do what's called the knowledge, which involves them studying the 25,000 streets of London. And it's been famously recorded that when London cabbies start training for the knowledge, they have the same brain uh, physiology as a normal person. But by the end of it, they have an enlarged hippocampus. The hippocampus is the part of the brain that pulls together memories uh, and knits them together because memories are formed by various different bits of your brain. But it's the hippocampus, if you like, that sort of stores them all. It's a bit like your sort of RAM, if you want to use a computer analogy. And um, the, the cabbies have an engorged hippocampus. It's, it literally grows. Um, and they do that just through repetitive memorization techniques so again if you want to make your brain work better you can so conclusions can you enhance your intelligence yes and you don't need to use cognitive enhancers such as and in particular illegal drugs that's a very bad idea because illegal drugs have some appalling side effects um, you can use some legal drugs like music music is a a, a psychoactive drug because it affects the way your brain works and it's completely completely legal and it does help enhance your cognition uh coffee is also very good for uh helping you uh you concentrate um but frankly there's nothing quite like uh just eating well sleeping well uh and drinking plenty of water so if you want to make sure that your brain is working at its absolute finest make sure that you're treating your body well because as we've seen body and mind are completely interlinked and whatever you do to your body will affect your brain. So that's a pretty straightforward way to enhance your intelligence. Um, how can you manage other people's perception of your intelligence? So as, we, as I've been trying to argue, intelligence, what we think of as intelligence is a mixture of objective reality and subjective perception. How can you shape the way other people perceive your intelligence? 
for a lot of us, that means going to prestigious universities or getting some sort of other um, mark of reputation that we can show off so that other people, it's a bit like wearing armor. We can sort of say, no, I'm definitely intelligent because I've gone to X university or I've got this sort of recognition. So that's a common way of doing it. But I think we should also just be very careful that we're doing though, we're seeking out those things for the right reasons, that we're seeking them out because they are going to make us happier and not because we're constantly trying to please other people. So be very careful about how you deal with other people's perceptions of intelligence. And that leads to my final point, which is how can you be sure it is your intelligence? I've already spoken about cognitive dissonance, where this ideological framework tells us we ought to favor these types of intelligence versus the operational reality, which is that we may not find that terribly easy or comfortable. And that dissonance can be very, very damaging. So please be careful not to indulge the ideology too far. If someone says women don't do maths, just tell them that's nonsense. And I'm going to do maths if I want to. Make sure that you have sufficient degree of self-confidence to say no if there's this sort of ideological framework about what makes someone bright or smart that you don't accept. And ultimately, if you want to enhance your intelligence, it just takes work and it takes effort. Uh, so don't fall into the trap of believing that you have an intelligence quotient, an IQ, which is immutable and fixed. Because that's the danger of the word like quotient is that you're sort of handed it out at birth and you carry it around you, with you for the rest of your life. But reams of research and evidence suggest that you can augment the quotient, you can grow it or diminish it. So if you want to be brighter, go for it. Now is your chance, right? You can take that opportunity, you can run with it. You already have the natural acuity. Now you need to just take, see how far you can take it. But do it for your own sake. Do it because it'll make you happier. Do it because it'll make you see the universe through new eyes. Don't do it because you want to dominate someone else or because you want to sort of prove someone wrong. Do it because you love it, okay? Those are always the best reasons to do it. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and see if there are any uh, questions. And if not, we will plow on to the next session because I want you to be able to meet all of your uh, fellow teammates. So thank you all for watching. Um, okay, great, looks like there aren't. So I will sign off here. And if you go back to the um, uh, timetable, you'll see that there are different team meetings. So make sure that you First of all, click on the plenary session button because then that will take you into a big meeting with all of you. And then you can filter off into your different teams and get to know each other. Um, sorry, this is overrun a little bit, um, but uh, thank you so much for turning up. Uh, I hope you're all well and I'll be seeing more of you today and for the rest of the week. So yeah, cheers. See you soon.